Um, and thanks, thanks for having me. Um, the issue of eligibility is in the legislation. Um, probably the area that is less clear at the moment is the issue of mental health. Uh, there's still, still some deliberations going on, going on in Canberra uh, with the senior working group, uh, ministerial um, uh, interest in that, obviously. Um, but the eligibility criteria obviously is, thank you, um, is, is around um, do you live in the launch site? Clearly, is one. Um, are you, um, in terms of chronological age, do you meet the launch site criteria? So, zero to 65 in, in the Barwon area, the same in New South Wales, 15 to 24 in Tasmania, and of course, it's the children um, in South Australia at the moment. So, it, uh, and these have been done deliberately so that we get some different learnings across those four launch sites. There's some issues around um, residency. Um, in terms of Australian residency and citizenship um, are a requirement that's quite consistent with federal social security legislation, uh, but does mean that there will be a handful of people possibly who are receiving state-based services who may not be eligible, but we are, seek, we are reaching agreements with the states around continuity of care. The minister was very clear around nobody being disadvantaged. So there are people who are currently getting services, uh, small numbers, um, but in terms of coming across to the launch site um, or continuing to, continuing to get their services uh, by way of state-based support. So those arrangements are, um, are being concluded at the moment. Their definition of disability is reasonably clear um, and it's in the Act. So it covers uh, of, of, of part mental health for the moment because of, of its current deliberations, but it's uh, physical, intellectual, cognitive, sensory, um, I've forgotten the thing? developmental. Yeah. Um, and um, where there's um, one or more aspects of activities of daily living that, that the disability has a significant impact on is effectively the, the, the thumbnail view of the eligibility. Uh, yeah, I think that's the intention. Um, there will be a lot of, um, there will be extra funding, as you've mentioned, uh, announced in the budget, uh, part funded by um, uh, an increase in the Medicare level and also um, our general revenue uh, through cuts into other areas. Um, and uh, the idea is that it will be an entitlement system, so there won't be caps, so that uh, individuals will develop goals and um, whatever's needed that's considered um, uh, reasonable and um, fair and reasonable and necessary, thank you, I was trying to think what the other word was, necessary and reasonable will be allowed under the system and it should get rid of the weights. So if you need a, uh, a new wheelchair because you're developing scoliosis, um, rather than having to wait 18 months and fundraise through different sources and charities and so on, by which time your scoliosis has become a lot worse, um, you should be able to have that as part of your goal, um, anticipate that you'll need it and then get it when it's needed. So. Uh, it, there's no there's no cap. It's based on entitlement, like unemployment benefits are. Once you meet the criteria, um, once you've you've uh, made your goals and you've got made your goals, sorry, and you have, it's a, it's a reasonable and necessary requirement. Then it's covered. Can I jump in there? Sorry, just to clarify that, who determines the fair and reasonable? Disability Care Australia. Based on. A big criteria. We'll come to questions in a moment. I think we, we might have to hand that yeah. one over to this. <laughs> um, we'll, see, there will be time, plenty of time for questions, but I just want to come to one more because a number of people also asked this in advance, which was about um, advocacy, and uh, Julie's already alluded to this. A couple of questions around that, and uh, maybe Julie and Philippa can respond. Is there within the NDIS scheme sufficient funding for advocates? And is there an opportunity for people to have a choice of advocate? Do we know that at this stage? Well, if you're asking me about facts, maybe someone else can, can answer that. But um, one thing I can say, and that's with my hat on as being on the board of um, Disability Advocacy Victoria, which is the peak body, um, that this is being discussed. We have been pushing for it. Um, and um, I think the key word is independent advocacy outside because that's going to be the only guarantee that um, there's no conflicts, etc. Um, my understanding from the advocacy sector is that their opinion is that there is insufficient marked out 
and part of that is because it's insufficient now. If you look at the advocacy agencies in Victoria, um, they're tiny, and I'll give you an example. My organisation is 2.6 people, and we, we, that includes all of us, and we have to cover the state of Victoria for all disability discrimination matters. And so, you know, there's your token advocacy organisations which have a name, but if you look at the staffing and their capacity and ask them now if they can cope with the advocacy cases that they have, they will say no. So clearly there's got to be a huge injection of funds if they're able to adequately um, assist people through this system. But who can answer exactly how much um, is, is being put aside and what the status is at the moment with advocacy. Does anyone know? I can take a step. Everyone's looking at each other. Look, Philippa, here we go. Um, the question of advocacy being whether it should be paid for by Disability Care Australia was something that the Senate inquiry gave quite a lot of attention to. And um, NDS's response to the questions we received on it has been that, yes, advocacy is incredibly important and very necessary to for the proper op operating of the scheme alongside adequate complaints processes and the like. However, we've been very clear that that funding for the advocacy should not be tied and should not be coming from Disability Care Australia, the agency itself. That um, the funding needs to come from a separate government department, whether it's FACSIA or the Attorney General's department, um, just to avoid those conflicts of interest and to maintain independence so the advocacy organisations don't feel at all compromised by taking complaints to an agency that was also funding them. So that's been our stance and I understand that that's the way things will be. Um, in the legislation um, for the NDIS, they make it clear that advocacy is very, very important um, and it's clearly stated in the legislation itself will fund it and that funding will come from other government departments. Thank you. Um, the, the term that's in the legislation is reasonable and necessary and it goes back, it goes back to the um, what's relevant to the goals that are in the participants plan. So that's sort of the foundation, I guess, cornerstone of what we would look at. Um, there are operational guidelines um, that have been developed that will assist the, um, the staff and the organisation make that decision. Um, and that's, that's been developed um, in conjunction with other similar organisations. It's, it's a legal concept. It exists in lifetime care and support in New South Wales um, and also in, uh, in Transport Accident Commission here in Victoria, as well as the Accident Compensation Commission in, um, in New Zealand. So there's been uh, in terms of policy development and operational guidelines, there's been considerable um, exploration of what has worked and, and what's been developed by those organisations that do have a longer history um, and where these concepts have been well tested out through case law. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a reviewable decision. Um, if the participant or the person representing them believes that the decision by the organisation or the agency is incorrect, uh, they will be able to take that through a reviewable process. But it's looking at things like, um, in terms of reasonable, um, is it the most appropriate option to meet that need? Is it age appropriate? Is it the most cost effective option over time? Not necessarily the cheapest. I need to be clear about that uh, because this is an insurance scheme and, and we, we do have the ability to look at the impact of um, a return on investment decision. So we would be funding early intervention, be funding levels of uh, technology and equipment and modifications to offset the, um, the otherwise ongoing cost of personal support. That is the stuff that really drives long-term cost up in a scheme that's got an insurance base. Um, and where is the evidence? Um, and increasingly, we will be interested in building evidence-informed and, and evidence-based practice. So uh, we want to purchase more of what works and purchase less of what doesn't. Yes, I just wanted to add that I've, I've developed a hatred of that term, reasonable. It, it, it's um, a term that's included, for example, in the Disability Discrimination Act, reasonable adjustments. And don't lawyers love to argue for hours on what is reasonable and what is not reasonable? Um, such a subjective term, so I actually haven't seen the guidelines yet, so it'll be very interesting to see how, how they're formed um, because someone's interpretation of reasonable and another person's could be completely different. The, 
the, there's a number of ways of doing this. Look, some people are, are, um, are well on top of this already, and effectively they will come knowing very clearly what it is that they want to do. Um, and the discussion that will then happen with the planner assessor uh, within uh, within the agency will be um, what supports do you need to achieve those goals, and where are those supports coming from? Um, however, given that this is a this is a, a currently a crisis-driven system, this may be the very first time that someone has been asked that question. So um, obviously the use of informal supports will be important. People that know and understand and care for that participant will be hugely valuable um, in that discussion. We need to be careful, particularly when it's um, adult participants and adult carers, that uh, we, are, we, we understand enough about the family circumstances to represent in the plan the participants' goals, but also acknowledge the support needs of the carers. Um, and that's particularly true and has been an aspect of a lot of discussion with older mums and dads um, who have older, um, older children, adult children, still living at home. So we need to be respectful of those relationships. Um, there's an opportunity, obviously, to engage with us early in terms of working with a local area coordinator to start exploring what your options might be, what your goals might be. And the plan is not a plan for life. Um, you know, if you, if you just want to take a little baby step um, and start testing out some of and exploring some of the opportunities that previously you may not have had the ability to do so, we'll support you in that. But it's, it's very individualised. Um, so small, small steps for some people um, because they've never had the opportunity to, to explore and learn and make choices as the rest of us have done. But other people, and I'm particularly um, reflecting on a conversation I had with a participant uh, who's got a spinal cord injury, um, you know, he's, he's, he's well on top of it. He doesn't, he knows exactly what he wants to do, um, knows exactly what supports he needs, um, and doesn't actually require a lot of our help uh, to, to either um, come to that conclusion or to then bring his plan to life. But other people are at the other end of the continuum. Look, thanks, Jenny, for that question. It, it's obviously something that have we have been turning our minds to considerably because we work in that space uh, to a large degree. Um, we certainly have made submissions uh, to government and uh, we are working on a project now around supportive decision making uh, for people who have uh, complex communication needs. We know that people can express their wishes, their choices, with the appropriate support. It does require a high level of skill and understanding and we need to see that embedded in these processes to ensure that that voice is heard. Uh, we talk, and Liz has talked about, we addressing the circle of support. We know that there are people who know each other well, who understand each other's choices and needs, but we need to make sure that the central voice is heard. And we believe that one of the ways of doing this is, is embedding uh, the skill set and capability around supportive decision making. I'm not sure if anyone else on the panel would like to add a comment. Uh, Julie? Um, yes, I, I think um, that uh, resources such as Auslan interpreters, and while there is not um, an accreditation that I know of for communication support workers currently, uh, there needs to be some um, definition of an independent communication support worker in order that people with complex communication needs are are not talked over. Um, the difficulty or the challenge is that many people with complex communication needs haven't to date been provided with the equipment and the trained communication support workers to date to have developed um, really good communication skills to their potential. So I think in that case it'll have to be a moving feast um, because if you can't communicate properly what you need you're obviously not going to get it. But in the meantime I think there's just got to be some quality about the people that are asked to uh, interpret or facilitate um, people who aren't going to be able to verbally express their needs. Liz, I see you're also nodding furiously there. Mm. Oh, two visits, oh, sorry. Yeah. Liz Manning first. Oh, um, yeah, I was going to um, say that this is going to be very important um, in, a, in for the courts and so on as well because I think people with disability um, and don't end up having a voice in the courts because they're considered um, unable to express or give reliable evidence and I think that's a, a really important um, uh, right to have and um, part of being um, more fully engaged and, and um, protected by society. 
Um, and also, I know that the, well, there is some fantastic technology around and anyone can communicate um, with the appropriate supports. Um, the appropriate supports are not just the technology though, they're also the ongoing uh, training, help, um, modelling and so on that, that um, enables that technology to be best used as well. Ms Kins, did you have something to add? I think, um, just to reiterate what Julie was saying, um, there's no magic wand for the 1st of July. Um, this, is, this is really significant social reform. Um, and attached to that is really significant sector development as well. So I think it's, it's absolutely um, understood that there are significant gaps um, that need to be addressed and um, that requires a whole of sector approach. Well actually I was, I was hoping that we could answer it in a two part. What the actual answer is, I, I don't know, but one of the things that I was going to say is that um, being an insurance company, I guess there's a little bit of suspicion about um, any internal uh, reviews because insurance companies um, like to save money for a, a number of reasons. And I guess it links back into uh, the advocacy. I have seen, um, there is a, a graded process that I have seen, I just can't remember it, which is if you're not happy with this, you do that, da, da, da. But um, I think you're right that um, it needs to happen very quickly because it's like um, taking on legal cases three years later, you might get a result, but it's actually too late. Um, so I think that it's vital um, and it links in with advocacy, but as to the actual steps, does anyone remember them? Um, I can tell you what it is today. It doesn't mean it's going to be like that tomorrow. Um, obviously, um, the, the desire is to resolve these things as quickly and as locally as possible. So there is an administration process whereby someone who uh, is more senior in the organisation would, would conduct an administrative review. And um, that decision can be then changed at that point. Um, if the person, and that would, I can't recall the timeframes, but they will be literally a short number of working days for that process to be completed, assuming we've got all the information that we would need to have uh, to complete that comprehensively. Um, if the person is still unhappy at that process, they can then go to more of a formal review process, which currently is a panel. Um, I'm certainly not aware that the issue of the Ombudsman that you've spoken about has been put in place at this stage. That's not to say that it, um, it wouldn't happen in full scheme. And I think if you think about a national approach to complaints and safeguarding and quality, uh, what, what, we, uh, what we have committed to in the launch sites is a continuation of the existing state-based processes. And now that's clearly for the purposes of launch, for the period of launch. Um, now if you think about a national rollout, uh, which the government's asked, have signed up to and are committed to, you can't run a state-based approach to quality and safeguarding or complaints management. So over time, um, the intention of the agency is to literally identify the best practice as it exists right across the jurisdictions, pull that out and build a national consistent approach. It makes no sense that if you're living in South Australia, you have to go through a different process and you have different quality and safeguarding aspects than if you're living in Barwon. Um, but that will be the case, that that's the agreement that's in the intergovernment agreement and in the bilaterals, that for the period of launch, for the launch sites, we are working with the current state-based practices. Um, I'm going to share this question with Jennifer, so I can talk to you about, um, from the agency point of view, a provider to be paid by the agency. Um, no, I'll go backtrack. Um, um, participants will have options. Some of them will choose to manage their own plan. They will effectively um, take the money and they'll make some choices about uh, what they go and do with that. And they, the direct relationship then exists between them and whomever they choose to engage as a service provider. They will then need to acquit back to us, the participant will need to acquit back to us by way of a statement. But effectively the contractual and, and the purchasing arrangements are solely between them and whomever they choose to engage. We anticipate a very small number of people will want to do that initially, um, although we hope that that will increase over time. So if you look at the most developed and individualised self-directed funding model, which is probably the UK, still at the stage t well over 10 years in, um, less than 30% of people have chosen to do that. So I looked at the ISP figures in the Barn and Launch area, there's just short of 1,000 people on individual support plans, only 22 of those people currently are truly self-managing, self-directing. Um, and about another 60 are going through a financial intermediary agency which um, in the agency uh, legislation is a plan management organisation. So clients have the ability to 
self-manage, uh, to take their package and their plan and go to a plan management organisation and have that done on their behalf, or choose to engage the agency to do that. So what would happen is the agreed, um, the agreed supports and the agreed providers um, it's, it is elected by the client, the participant. We then load that on a, uh, in the IT system and the provider who has been elected to, um, by the client to uh, provide all or some of those services then gets visibility against that and they then um, can lodge an invoice and that invoice will be paid against that approval uh, cost centre or cost line and payments made within two working days. Thank you. Jennifer? I think it's an excellent question, one that I think the sector is turning its mind to very seriously. I think there are two components to it. One, you mentioned the back office cost. Um, that needs to be transparent in the costing of services. I think that the customer will expect to know what they are purchasing. I think that the sector needs to look at evidencing best practice in that matter. So, for example, we are benchmarking uh, at a state and now a national level, our back office of services, so we know where we can sit and we can evidence that to a customer in terms of our service efficiency. Uh, in terms of the cost of services, I think we now need to take a very much a customer focused and a customer assistive, assistive approach where we would look at options of bundling of services, of options around service delivery models uh, in terms of where those services might be delivered. Are uh, they delivered one to one or in a group setting? Uh, are some of them delivered at distance so that we maximise the opportunity for the person to achieve the outcomes uh, they're seeking against their goals. So I think it is a two, from the service per uh, perspective, provider perspective, it's really the two elements being transparent about what your costs are and optimising the outcome for the person in terms of being very fle flexible in the service delivery models and having those costed uh, at a very sophisticated level and real-time level so that people can make informed decisions. I'll take, I'll take the first bit. I guess there's a lot of um, what is acknowledged is there's a lot of unknown, um, and that is the absolute reason why the launch sites have been constructed and developed and set up as they are. Um, they look different, they operate differently, um, and the, that's been a very deliberate decision um, by the states and by central government uh, so that we do get those learnings. Um, the, other probably, the other aspect I'd like to comment on is um, the requirement of the, of the agency to really understand the full cost of um, an individual support need over the, over the entire life of that individual and also um, aggregated up by way of specific client cohorts and understand what makes a difference in terms of improving and maintaining that individual's um, independence and participation, both in community and employment, um, and the, the, the consequent impact on what would be the need for otherwise funded services over the life of that individual. They are things that you simply um, wouldn't want to know, wouldn't want to ask, and haven't been asked when you're dealing with a rationed healthcare system. If you ask that information, you then have an obligation to do something with that. So when you're working on a 12-month or three-year contract basis, um, they're short of uh, the, the work that the PC Commission did in the earlier report that was uh, referred to by Access Economics, the current funders um, just simply haven't had the ability to ask or understand that information or collect it. And because it hasn't been collected, there's a whole lot of things that we yet don't know, and that is the purpose of the launch. There's going to be extraordinary demands on the organisation to collect a level of information and analyse that that simply hasn't happened to date. And that will inform um, the ongoing rollout. So this many, I guess, back to the economics, it's a half a percent levy, which is a partial funding at the moment. If we do reach this, this goal of being able to meet all these needs, what is it going to mean? Um, OK, well, my, my, my tried answer to the initial question was going to be slowly. <laughs> um, that, uh, and as Liz has said, you know, that's the sort of thing that um, will become more apparent. But I also want to make a comment about that, that um, for a lot of uh, people with disability, it's not really, in some ways, rocket science what, what they're likely to need. The courts make judgments about this when there are the very, very rare compensations that go through. So, um, there, you know, there are ways of um, anticipating needs over a person's lifetime, which, which Liz has spoken about. In terms of the economics about it, of it, um, there have been several reports on um, 
outcomes for disability, people with disabilities in Australia. And um, this goes back to one of the earlier things that, I've, that I'm very interested in that I was talking about. It's the costs of not doing something. Um, so in terms, of, and you mentioned um, a workforce and labour force and so on. So at the moment, 31% of people with disabilities participate in the workforce compared to 80%, 83% who don't have disabilities. And that's one of the worst outcomes in OECD um, countries. Um, outcomes for poverty, uh, in OECD countries, Australia is about the worst. So 45% of people with disability live in or near poverty compared to 22%, which is the, uh, which is the OECD average. Uh, and there are other costs associated with that. Female carers have a 50% chance of a major depressive episode. Um, Wellbeing amongst carers is the lowest in the country. Um, primary carers, 71% uh, of whom are women, are likely to be in the poorest two fifths of households and so on and so forth. Against that, um, we have the productivity, uh, sorry, the price uh, report done by Price Waterhouse Coopers in 2011 that said that if Australia could achieve employment outcomes at the level of the top eight OECD countries, then there would be an extra $50 billion of GDP um, that could be generated um, by 2050. So about 1.4% contribution to GDP. So um, this is a system, going back to Maureen's initial question, that makes good economic sense. And um, I think um, those uh, helping to get more people back into work is good for health and well-being, and um, it also makes good financial sense. There will be people that, that won't be able to, to do that, um, and uh, uh, but but their carers may be that we may be able to um, help carers to get back in. So overall, you should see an increase in participation amongst carers and people with disability, and that will help mitigate some of the other costs. So even if you don't think about it from a human dignity and human rights perspective, it does make economic sense. Accommodation. Um, is an absolute um, understood gap in the in the system. Uh, whilst the scheme hasn't uh, been funded to make the capital investment, there is an expectation, um, and it's been built into the costings that there is um, uh, there needs to be sufficient in an individual support package that would encourage uh, more innovation and more players into that market. Um, some of the um, Practical Development Fund initiatives that are coming to fruition now have addressed that um, it, the issue of accommodation in particular, and um, it's it's an area that will require a lot of innovation, um, and I think in itself probably requires a strategy to. It's I know, I know the numbers here. Um, there's been some good inroads through the uh, YPRAC um, initiative, which of course now has come to an end. Um, but straight away, uh, we've got close to 40 people in the Barwon area who have an immediate pressing need. Now, they're only the ones that current state departments know about. And as we go out and have, um, over the next 12 months, and have conversations with families and participants, uh, that number will increase. And it's going to be a very real challenge. Uh, it's a very hot button for the minister at the moment, um, and certainly is well on the radar. Um, but the, we, we're talking about years and years of underfunding um, in that infrastructure. Um, and again, this is something that um, I don't think realistically can be turned around in a very short space of time. Suffice to say that it is an absolute priority area for the, for the agency. And Jennifer? Um, I'll take it uh, from the provider end. Uh, historically, we, I think you and, and many, myself and many of the people in the room who've worked in the sector over a period of years, uh, witnessed deinstitutionalisation and we moved to uh, essentially in Victoria a bed-based model of supported accommodation, so uh, five bedroom homes, uh, where people who became eligible for a supported accommodation uh, awaited really an available bed in, in a house. In Victoria, the largest provider of supported accommodation uh, is government uh, through the Department of Human Services. Um, from the perspective of a provider, we would own and operate uh, around 67 sites across Victoria. We know that that uh, infrastructure is ageing. Often it wasn't purpose-built. 
uh, it doesn't meet the needs of people whose support needs are changing over time as they age. Um, we know that it's time to do things differently. We certainly are spending a lot of time working with property developers and affording uh, affordable housing groups to look at how we can mainstream uh, accessible accommodation for people with a disability. So we need to incentivise new developments, whether they be uh, key ring developments, whether they be low-rise apartment developments or high-rise apartment developments, uh, to ensure that components of those are built to platinum standards. That means standards that are accessible and suitable for people with high support needs. And we want those to be blended. We don't want people living in isolation. So we want to start negotiating with property developers that at least 25% of those developments would be accessible property. Now, people think traditionally, and I know our houses are not saleable on the open market. We've customised them to a high level. But we need to now develop property options, whether they be still in five bedroom houses or whether they be in apartments uh, where we provide services into an apartment block. They need to be attractive on the open market. We know we have an ageing population. We know that if we build to platinum standards, that will enable uh, an ageing couple uh, to also access such a property and that it's quite attractive to them. So we need to start having these debates with the developers, with government, and actually unpack and understand that it is an attractive option in an ageing population. It will meet the needs of people with a disability. And we need to really challenge what we think is true inclusion and quality in supported accommodation. I think we're just on the cusp of that now, and I think that's very exciting. And I think that the supported accommodation uh, innovation grants were one way of addressing that. I think we need to take that further. And I think people with a disability need to have clear control of voice in that process.